being here today. Um, so we have a lot of new members to the youth board. And, uh, yes, thank, thank you, thank you, wonderful. So I wanted to ask you, as we begin introductions, to just say your name, your what you do uh, work-wise, if you're on the youth board or you, with the workforce committee, and how long you've served. So we're going to start to the left. Um, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Sumter. Um, I started on the youth board, I think, in 2012. Nine, um, I was just born in that um, city hall, city council. And it's been a great run. Yeah. I see a lot of change that would make me good. That's about it. Welcome aboard. Hi, good morning. My name is Sandy Trujillo. This is my first day at the youth board. Uh, I'm currently uh, working with the I Have a Dream Foundation, a uh, national organization, the national office. We support young people from an early age to be able to get into college. I am Jackie Chang. I am the director of education at Great Arts Media, and um, I am a youth board member. Good morning. I'm Suzanne Peters, I'm a family and parent advocate at the Jewish Community Center. Hi, good morning. My name is Jordana Pogombi. I am the director of the David Rubenstein Atrium at Lincoln Center. We do free performances all year round, as well as family programs uh, all year round as well. Thank you. Yeah. I'm new. <laughs>
Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Haas, I'm Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Contracts, Budget, and Special Services at uh, the New York City Department of Social Services. I'm Leah Hebert, I'm the Director of Intergovernmental and Program Partnerships at the Center for Youth Employment. Good morning, I'm Megan Keenan, I'm the Senior Director of Youth Workforce Policy at DYC.
and you know, most of our money, as you know, goes out the door. So it's not like we're spending a lot of money on, on new staff or things like that. It's really going to pay for wages of young people, uh, funding nonprofit services. And so the last year will be more about really changing the culture of NYCD, building the infrastructure, the things that uh, often happen behind the scenes but have a huge, huge impact on the quality of the services that we support. And things you've seen glimpses of this, uh, uh, we're going to be uh, rolling out a new data collection system called DYC Connect in uh, February of next year, and it will make life simple for everyone. Right? Instead of having four or five different systems, we'll have one system. We can track a person who's enrolled in the program through all the different programs. So if, they, if they're in summer youth employment, then you go to another program, we can figure out how we can maximize the impact of the money that we're investing in a given community. Uh, uh, today, you're going to hear a little bit about some of the things that don't cost money, but it's more about changing the culture. And you know, the government is part to change culture, just as like in any institution, we're used to doing things a certain way. And so uh, the uh, presentation we hear about customer, sir, uh, the customer satisfaction survey is a new territory for us. We really ask our customers how we're doing. I mean, that's not typical government. Government says, this is the way we do it, and like it or not, this is how we're doing it. So um, that's the preview of the, and then on the horizon, the only two major uh, funding opportunities next year, one will be the Beacon program, which this year marks the 25th anniversary, and we've gotten increased funding thanks to the mayor's support for the first time in 20 years that the program has gotten the new funding. We're in the process of uh, redesigning the summer youth employment program for the first time in seven years. Uh, thanks again to the mayor and the city council, uh, $30 million permanent funding was added last June. And so the budget this year was $93 million, serving 60,000 young people. But unfortunately, the program has always been funded year to year. So we, for example, last year we had to bring on 25,000 young people in the last two weeks of June for a summer job. This year, when we convened the meeting of the 100 uh, SYP programs in this room, probably in mid-January, when it's probably going to be five degrees outside the plan <laughs> next summer, 80% of our budget will be known. 80%. Historically, it's 40%. So you can't really plan if you only know less than half your budget. So uh, I'm going to thank everyone last summer who uh, help develop job sites. Uh, for the new uh, board members, we hope that you can be a job site because uh, we'll be able to have uh, better planning, better screening of young people, and better matching so the young people get to, uh, to a work site that uh, fits into what their career interests might be. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over unless there are any questions. Any questions? Okay, so we're going to go into our first presentation the DYCD community needs assessment. Like look at me quizzically or something. Okay, raise your hand. Alright, so I'm gonna to talk to oh, here it is. Here it is coming up. Alright. So we're gonna to talk to you about a customer satisfaction survey that we were doing in that we're doing in relation to a community needs assessment uh, around the agency. Um, just in general for a community needs assessment, what's a community needs assessment? It's what we try to do as an agency to identify needs and, and, and um, for the purpose of coming up with solutions around the issues of alleviating uh, poverty, the effects of poverty, with a vision to import 
DYCD's efforts in the future and how we're going to respond programmatically and uh, with funding re uh, resources, etc. Uh, particularly, I am Joe Catron and I'm the director, I'm the uh, senior advisor rather to the Deputy Commissioner for Community Development, Sandra Gutierrez. And in our community development unit, we deal with the anti poverty money known as Community Services Block Grants, which is a federal uh, anti poverty stream. And through that street, through that program, we do um, every three years or so a community needs assessment working with our our 42 local, what's called neighborhood advisory boards throughout the city um, and identify the low-income uh, neighborhoods. Uh, we have about uh, 300 or so local volunteers that help us do this. And in the past, what they've done is they've done surveys of people on the street and they've held public hearings. And that was been the consi that's been consistent with our needs assessment has been. This year, we're doing things a little different in conjunction with uh, the new vision that Commissioner Chong has brought us with DYCD being more the uh, settlement house from New York City. We've expanded the way we're doing this needs assessment. So we've, we've involved uh, much more people, more and more constituent groups than we've done in the past. We've expanded the way the um, surveys have been handled, the way they were written, the way they're being conducted and collected. We have them being um, collected not only on paper throughout the city, but we also have them being uh, submitted electronically, uh, which is, is uh, the first time we've been doing this with, uh, this way. Um, so in addition to what I would, what we had done in the past with the community, with the neighborhood advisory boards on the street, we've expanded the amount of people who we've gone to to speak to. That was just street surveys. We did about 8,600 surveys last time around. It was single big surveys. This time around, we've included employers for Landers for Leaders. For the first time, we've done youth, interfaith uh, leaders. Uh, we've expanded what we call community uh, key informants, which before was just uh, city council staff and community board. Now we're putting all elected officials in New York City, plus community board staff, um, and we've been engaging people on a much layer, on a much different and deeper layer level than we've done in the past. So we, we get results in unmatched ways that we would never, we had not had this information in the, uh, before. Today you're going to be going to hear a little bit about one piece, one snapshot of that um, of this needs assessment. But just to give you the scope of what the needs assessment entails, just give you some. So sort of an idea. So the NAB part of it, which is just like I said, just one piece of it with all the other pieces that are going on. The NAB part, from last time when we did 8,600 one-page surveys, this survey has been redone to, do, to entail six pages of very rich and deep information about demographic, social, economic uh, factors, all that, all that uh, stuff in the in the surveys. So they're six pages long. Um, we have probably, at this point we have about 9,000 on the street. In fact, that translates to 54,000 pages of rich data, just in that one sector of the uh, street surveys that the neighborhood advisory boards are um, helping us do with the department of the community development section, the sector of the agency, plus with the planning department and with uh, beacons and cornerstone um, and things like that. So today you're going to hear from Astra Spoda, who is with the planning department, and she's going to walk you through one of the sectors that we did in the community Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right, so um, as Joe was saying, once we complete this whole multi-method, multi-stakeholder data collection process, the next step is really for one component of the needs assessment is to formulate um, the needs. Um, and basically, what we're going to do based on survey questions and responses to those survey questions, we're going to um, calculate um, the interest and needs that they articulated, um, and we're gonna compare it with um, the programs, services, um, and other interests that people wanted to participate in or needed but weren't able to access. We're gonna compare that. Um, and then also taking into account other external resources that are available as it aligns with um, those needs um, and then that's how we formulate needs and that will be going on later on and we'll debrief you on those findings when they're ready um, but once those needs are identified um, we're going to be the agency is going to embark on prioritizing those goals uh, those needs identifying recommendations and creating an action plan and that process is going to be collaborative um, it's going to in, um, entail 
all different members, representative members of DYCD departments. Um, thereafter, we'll be sharing out those results, um, those recommendations and that action plan, um, and then working with CBOs co um, collaboratively to implement those solutions. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, it's important to note, though, that this process is not a linear process. It's meant to be iterative. It's meant to be repeated. Um, we want to be a learning organization, so um, basically we want to be able to respond to needs um, quickly um, and also to be able to discern and ascertain different trends so that we are constantly serving people in your city. So, um, although we're in the midst of analyzing the data on the needs, um, we did complete one component, as Joe mentioned. Um, the first component of the community needs assessment that I'm going to be sharing is customer satisfaction. Um, so, as mentioned previously, this data, um, we solicited data from program directors at community-based organizations. Um, for this particular survey, um, we solicited feedback from those with contracts um, between July 1st, 2015 and June 30th, 2016. So that's what this, these findings will reflect, that time period. Um, overall, we received 372 responses um, from 28 different um, program areas within DYCD, which represents 98% of our program areas, so it's pretty representative of all of our different programs. Um, the programs, the, when we looked at the composition of program directors, we found that they were um, that um, about two out of three, um, actually, the contracts they worked on. They worked on contracts for three years or less, so they're really bringing a fresh perspective. It's not um, on like how we um, liaise with D um, CBOs and how we interact with them and the rapport that we've built over time. So just to keep that in mind as we delve into these results. All right, so in terms of um, communication and exchanges with DYCD staff, um, overall, we found that four, about four out of five were satisfied with their interactions with DYCD um, regarding the oversight of their contracts. Um, we received particularly high marks on um, professionalism and confidence, which is great. Um, and then almost three out of four program directors... By the way, um, it was an anonymous survey. Yes, it was anonymous. Okay. So, there was, so they could go <laughs> crazy and give every, you know air their grievances or give us positive feedback. So, um, almost three out of four program directors responded affirmatively to the prompts that we provided about the instruction clarity, about the instructions that we provide in terms of their clarity, um, and then our responsiveness. Um, but they were still the lowest um, scored criteria on the um, communication and interaction scale here. Um, in terms of the ease with which um, CBOs could connect with DYCD staff when they have questions or concerns. Um, on average, two out of three felt it was easy to connect with DYCD staff member or unit when they had a question or a concern. Um, we received really high marks in terms of the ease with which um, we could connect regarding um, general program oversight, site visit monitoring, and compliance. Um, as you can see, 74% said it was easy to connect about general program oversight. 73% said it was easy to connect um, with staff about site visit monitoring. And then 71% said it was easy to connect about compliance. Um, but then um, in terms of the lowest scored criteria um, on the staff accessibility scale was a budget or audit issues, procurement, um, and legal issues. Uh, in terms of just satisfaction with general um, program oversight areas, um, there was very high support for um, the support provided by program staff, uh, followed by site visit monitoring and program work scope development and modification, which is akin to the previous um, scales that I discussed. Um, and then again, akin to the, the previous criterion and the um, scale, um, Program directors were the least satisfied with the oversight provided for budget issues, um, followed by training from program staff um, and capacity building activities. In terms of meetings like this one, um, almost three out of four program directors were um, satisfied with uh, the meetings facilitated by DYCD. In particular, respondents felt that the information presented was clear, 
um, and relevant to their program, um, and that they were scheduled and facilitated um, appropriately. Um, the lowest scoring criteria on the meeting scale was in terms of that the information provided in the meetings would spark discussion on innovation and quality improvement. Um, we also collected some qualitative information about um, their feedback on meetings in general. Um, what we found is that um, participants expressed more interest in liaising with their um, particular their, uh, program managers within these meetings, some more interaction with URCD staff. Um, and also, um, they really wanted to leverage the assets and expertise of other CBOs in the room. They felt that um, we called on external presenters a lot when there was all of this talent um, and a really large breadth of experience that CBOs offer that perhaps we can integrate more in the meetings. Um, and in terms of topics that were of interest, people wanted to know more about participant retention and recruitment strategies, um, budgeting, dealing with special need populations, and then like sharing out programmatic best practices. Um, in terms of the evaluation and monitoring system, um, more than two out of three program directors were satisfied with um, the program quality and monitoring tool, which is our basically the way that we oversee and evaluate the contracts. Um, they felt the information that was in that PQM team, that's what we call it, the, the um, acronym, was clear, relevant to their program, um, and then strengthened their agency's ability to meet contractual um, objectives and to improve their performance. Um, they were the least satisfied with, um, with um, the, again, akin to the last scale, um, the report's ability to spark discussion on innovation and improvement, and there was some um, confusion or ambiguity around um, the computation of an overall score. Um, so they felt that they weren't sure that their evaluation was accurate, 64% of them. Um, in terms of the content of that PQMT, um, administrative requirements were deemed the, the, the most clear of the topics that were covered, followed by facility and management, and the least clear component of this tool um, was partnerships and relationships, like how to measure that and what that entails. And finally, um, in terms of the tools and resources disseminated and provided, the incident report form was, actually, was perceived as the most clear by the respondents, um, followed by guidelines for creating a welcoming environment, um, and the least clear tool disseminated was the fiscal manual, followed by the family development and credentialing um, program. So now that I've given you a whole lot of information about feedback, um, what's what are we going to do about it? What's next? Um, so collectively, we're going to internalize what the feedback was um, and try to turn it into action. Um, so as you may have heard. Previously, we are building a new system, um, uh, and which will, based on a lot of the features and functions of this system, are actually inherently going to improve a lot of the um, criteria and skills that I mentioned previously. So, for example, uh, DYC Connect is a one-stop shop. Um, it's already going to have um, communications and like paperwork transfer and um, workload. Um, sort of streamlined, it's all in one place, so it's automatically going to strengthen, increase, and um, streamline the communications between CBOs and providers, uh, I mean, between CBOs and DYCDs, so um, we think that that will bolster the responses going forward. Um, and also, in terms of the new evaluation and monitoring system, it's being overhauled, so a lot of the ratings that we talked about are actually um, changing so that there's more transparency regarding how these ratings are generated. Um, the mod, there's going to be modules or the components are going to be clarified. They're going to be more specified to each of the different programs. So again, more transparency and we think therefore more higher ratings on um, those indicators going forward. Um, and finally, with all of these new changes, um, we're going to be creating or we're in the process of creating an agency-wide um, scorecard and that basically is looking at different key performance indicators um, and tracking our progress against goals. Um, and a lot of the scales and criteria I mentioned today are going to be part of that scorecard. So um, we're going to formulate goals now that we're kind of internalizing this feedback 
and then trying to implement practices that will help improve upon all of these different things um, and track them through this scorecard. So that's what's on the horizon. Any questions? Employees or DYC What's the Employee. How many employees was the question? Oh, so uh, depending on how you count. So uh, I think our headcount is around 520, but then that it, that includes a lot of uh, seasonal staff because for the Summer Youth Employment Program, we uh, staff up for four or five months to run the program. I mean, I just want to say one thing about. So we had a uh, we had a. Uh, meeting with the Human Services Council. And so we were in the midst of doing this uh, customer survey. And so the Human Services Council, which is an umbrella group of many social service agencies providers, they're um, rolling out uh, their own version of a customer satisfaction uh, rating system. It's, it's like Yelp for city agencies. Uh, and that's, that was my description of it. And so they were excited to hear that we were already doing this because, you know, you know, as I said, government gen generally tends to be rigid, and we don't. You know, and there's some things we can't change. There are functions of regulations and law, but there are things we can change that we can streamline, like data collection. I know uh, we gave Nancy a preview. We had a meeting with the uh, capital change capital, capital uh, donor spot, and uh, you know, the biggest complaint they are hearing from the grantees is is how arduous the data collection is for us. And part of that is the legacy of being a merger of three smaller agencies with everyone with their own data system. And they didn't talk to each other. And it's typical of most government agencies, but we're small enough to fix it. And so uh, so this is all helpful because if, if you don't learn, you don't grow, and then you're not really being impactful. And so this is part of the culture change we're trying to introduce into DYCD in the last year of this term. Because, you know, we had to put this uh, agency in a solid footing for the next 20 years, and so part of that is really beginning to implement all these changes. Stand, stand next. I'm gonna hand it to you so I get done. But the uh, I'm I'm curious about the evaluation and monitoring system because you mentioned ambiguity. There's the, the Bruce found ambiguity in the process. I just want could you elaborate on that more? Was there more data? The report back. What was that ambiguity? And, and then what? I see here there's a sort of new evaluation system to provide transparency. What does that look like as far as your thinking right now? Um, uh, Denise will take this one. <laughs> She's the expert. I'm not the expert. Okay. Good morning. Um, Denise Williams, Deputy Commissioner for Planning Program Integration. So currently the tool has eight sections and about 15 indicators in each of the sections. And uh, historically, we've been trying to go for universality. And so you have different program areas responding to questions that really didn't apply to them, and they didn't know how to answer it correctly. So what we've done is still have some universal indicators, for example, some principles related to youth development or things related to family engagement, but then there are specific modules based on the program that you're monitoring. So if you're a program manager, you can become an expert in your area as opposed to having them look at indicators that may or may not have anything to do with you. The other thing I would say that there was no consistency between the overall rating that you got in this section and the overall rating you got in the tool. So you could get in eight areas like uh, three fairs and four goods and something else and they do arrive at an overall rating that you could not necessarily follow. And so we're trying to be more transparent about that. We're building in um, some things that are automated. So if you rate the support, the overall section can't get an expert. I mean, you'd see really disparate, no connections between the indicators, the section ratings, and the overall ratings. Part of it is a training issue, um, which is CBO leaders, you understand, we added a lot of folks in the last couple of years, so part of that's training. Part of it is operating in the gray area, right? With us not being able to pull out data to ensure people are following the policies 
So it's been very interesting that we've had policies written that have not necessarily been followed consistently. But now with the system, as you can see it, the different uh, deputy directors or directors can see more consistently across their portfolios how reading is happening. We can see outliers, you know, much more quickly. Um, so the reason I'm excited about the system is not that we can put data in, but that we can pull data out. Because we have systems here now um, that we use to monitor. The only way you can pull data out is if we ask IT to do a data dump that we would then be able to use now. We can just pull up our reports from our um, system. We are developing rubrics that will help folks assess more consistently, looking at, we'll never get to into a greater reliability, right? We are not staffed as evaluators, but we're trying to get as consistent as we can to a consistent approach to monitoring and evaluating um, indicators. Just a story I want to see my folks at DOE, and you know, they uh, talked about how they're monitoring UBK. Um, and it was amazing. They hired 200 people, give or take. And the folks who do contracting aren't the folks who do technical systems, who also aren't the folks who monitor, right? So they have a team of folks that that's what they do is monitor. And they do a lot of training, and you have to, you know, be tested consistently for integrator reliability. The program managers here do contracting, right? They also have to go do site visits and monitor. Uh, and they also, the capacity building that they were referring to, uh, not being happy, wasn't about our capacity building department. It was about getting capacity building from program managers. So the skill set that they need to have spans from that side to this side and is very different from fiscal to observing programs right, to uh, giving feedback to program directors, to meeting with principals. It's a, it's a very tough job, and they're really good at it. Um, and we're investing a lot in professional development and support, as well as creating a system that will automate things so that they don't have to wait. Like, you do this, you get that. And that automation is informed by their different program leaders who decided that these are the weights to the different indicators that we want to have, and this is what we are um, kind of saying are the uh, highest uh, rated indicators for us. And on top of that, we'll be explaining that to the different program directors and program areas for transparency. So, more than you wanted to know, but okay. First, congratulations, how far have you all gotten around this? One of, the, one of the areas that is not, it sounds like it's not the focus of this, and that's not meant as a criticism on my part, but ultimately in the end, whatever it is you're going to evaluate and help programs do better in terms of understanding your objectives, etc. There has always been, and I believe still remains, a concern about where do staff who work with young people, where do they come from? and where do they get trained. Most people do not wind up graduating, for example, from a bachelor's degree in youth development. They're not graduating in terms of having the kind of experience, academic experience, and in many other cases, you know, hands-on experience before they wind up coming to the programs. So in order for those programs to be good and to be able to meet the standards that you're laying out, and presumably will be clear to them what that is. There needs to be the base of the staff that's working there. And it's a, so it's a side question, is whether or not DYCD sees as part of its mission to look at what's happening out there in the CBOs and who the staff are, and what are ways that we can, I used to be, that we can improve who they are, not only in terms of recruiting people who become staff, but ultimately once they become staff. This program, frankly, as we all know, is only as good as the staff. And just one last thing about this, one of the things about youth programs, I believe, and other kinds of programs, particularly workforce programs, 
It is, it is only as good as the moment in time that you have a particular frontline supervisor and particular staff. And when they leave, it's almost like starting all over again. And so it's a side question to the issue of capacity building and making our programs better. Um, so you have talked a lot of things. There's retention in there, there's recruitment, there's training. So, um, and I, I want to give kudos to uh, Jean Mulgrath. But when I came here, DYCD had a budget of under a million dollars for capacity building. I mean, it's somewhere around five million now, which doesn't mean we're keeping up, but I think there's been a significant investment in that, starting with OST, um, out of school time. And out of school time was the first time the city put tax levy money into capacity building, because the money that DYCD had was historically federal money from community service block. So, and then with Sonic, our commissioner and mayor invested even more. And as part of that, it's not just the usual pace and expanded or task, um, but we've also partnered with CUNY. I mean, we take partnered with CUNY to develop the Youth Study Certificate Program. And we have scholarships. We invest in scholarships for frontline staff and supervisors to go to CUNY and get up to 12 credits. Can we pay for everybody? Not going to happen, but I think that we are really trying and have been consistent in our investment. I was assistant commissioner for capacity building, and so we, I worked a lot with Bill and Jeannie to try to expand the strategies we use for um, professional development. And to your point about internal, we work with TASK to develop something called coaching for quality, which was really looking at supervisors. Because it doesn't matter if you go out for training, if you come back as an adult learner and someone's not giving you real-time feedback and support. And so we really thought that the program directors, ed specialists, and the, that line that are with these staff consistently are the ones that we need to invest in. And so that's been the strategy for the last few years. Thank, thank you, Denise. I'm sorry. I know there are other questions, but we have to move on to the next presentation. Denise, we can share. Can we share your email if people have additional questions? Great. Thank, thank you. So we're going to move. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So we're going to move to the next presentation on the Summer Youth Employment Program, the financial literacy component. grand reveal a little bit, but I can definitely say that we achieved much more than we thought was possible. Um, I don't know if you've had the chance to review the SYP annual summary yet, um, but if you haven't, then this slide and these numbers are going to be new to you. Um, and if you have, then you've already had time to absorb um, the, the scale of the program that we had this summer. Um, it was the largest program that we, um, that DYCD administered um, under under our guidance. And so, um, when somebody looks at a program as large as our SYP, it, it's hard to think that we can infuse much more, uh, or that we can make the kind of change that we could with the small amount of time and the small changes that we instituted. Um, since I already gave up the great grand review and, and did say that results of our financial empowerment programming were huge. 
I will say that a third of the $60 million that were paid out in payroll, um, and the blue ribbon over there, were paid out in direct deposit. Now, when um, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but uh, when the pro when we were first approached by the city foundation, uh, about 8% of our participants were being banked. Um, we didn't get um, we didn't even get to the part where we could bank young people right away. Um, as many of you know, DYCD has been administering SYP um, for a little over over 10 years, um, and this is our SYP game of life where I can. Um, kind of point out where our big um, financial empowerment key moments were in the program development that allowed us to make the changes that we did this summer and achieve the results that we did. So in 2003, we began administering the program. Um, in 2004, we switched to payroll cards. And anybody who remembers the program of olden days uh, and remembers the mess that it was with paper checks. So this was a huge change, and for us it sort of became kind of grandfathered every course of it. Young people are going to be paid with payroll cards and not paper checks, but across the country, the vast majority of young people are still being paid with paper checks. So New York City has always been um, at least 10 years kind of ahead of the curve in how we're paying our young people and how we're exposing our young people to financial institutions. Um, throughout the course of the program, uh, you can see that we really switched to more of an online mode where everything, technology became the, how we run the program, how we're able to achieve the things that we are, whether it's last minute infusions of funding um, or financial empowerment programming. In 2010, we tried our first pilot with the um, Department of Consumer Affairs and uh, their Office of Financial Empowerment to try to bank young people. Um, at the time, we tried it sort of the traditional way, which was getting a group of young people, taking them to a bank, opening up bank accounts for them. And we realized that with the scale that our program is, it's just not a robust way to continue to do this. And we needed something different. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, those efforts sort of fell off. Our community-based organizations continue to do things on their own, but it was never a centralized effort, and it was never something that we as an agency were monitoring how, how they're doing on that. Um, and so in 2015, when we truly began um, our financial empowerment programming, um, here, I'll, I'll go through a few of the things that we did. Um, the great thing about receiving a private grant is it allows you this moment of introspection, which you don't really have when you're just running your program. And when you're running a good program, you never really have to stop and come, you know, step back from it and say, what else do we really have to do? Financial literacy has always been a part of SYP. All our young people are required to attend anywhere from two and a half to five hours of financial literacy training um, for our youngest youth. Uh, our 14 and 15 year olds, that's an entire day that they spend during their first pay week. So we've always known that it's important, but we didn't realize just how important it was. Um, and what we realized we had to do was really kind of conduct a culture change. Uh, some programs, as I've learned across the country, are what they call born financial empowerment programs. The programs are born with the idea that we're going to employ young people and we're going to have them immediately start banking, start fi healthy financial habits as part of their employability. That's not the case in New York. We're the oldest program in the country. And we have community-based organizations that have literally been running the program since its inception. So they have a very particular way of running the program and a very particular set of ideas about what it is. And it is getting a kid a job. Um, getting them paid, how you get them paid, what they do with their money, that's really secondary. So it really required a culture change to get our set of providers to understand that, in fact, this is one of the most important things that's going to happen. This is one of the greatest lessons that they're going to achieve in the summer. And um, they were skeptical at first. You know, as I said, this is our, this completed our third summer. Um, if any of you have ever been to one of our SYP provider meetings, these guys are tired people. They're very hardworking and very overworked people. And so when I would stand in front of them and sort of do the song and dance about, we're going to do this and it's going to be great and we're, it's going to be financial empowerment, their eyes would glaze over and they would say, okay, what else do you want us to do in addition to enrolling 10,000 kids next week? 
Um, so uh, it wasn't it wasn't a completely easy sell. But once the numbers started going up, once they realized how much their young people were interested in this kind of work, um, it, it really started. The idea started to sell itself. So here's a couple of the things that we did <coughs> as part of the culture change. We uh, partnered with CUNY and the Office of Financial Empowerment, the professor who actually developed the curriculum for the Office of Financial Empowerment, scaled down the six-month program to a two-day workshop. And all of our providers had to attend that two-day workshop to understand not just how to deliver financial literacy curriculum, the importance of it, and many of them walked away saying, I wish I had this earlier. This is important to my life. Because our, our CBO partners, they are experts in their fields, but they are not necessarily experts in financial so this was incredibly important for their own knowledge, for their knowledge of how do they select presenters when a bank comes in and wants to do a presentation, how do they evaluate if this is predatory or if this is actually beneficial for their young people. So this was the first step. It also really set kind of the mood of this is where the program is going for the next couple of years. This is important. This Consider this a vital part of the program. Um, then we did a lot of behavioral changes for our young people. And they seem like such small touches that produce the most incredible results. So, for example, as you know, there are programs, uh, SYP programs in the country. There are 100 young people. Miami's program is 150 young people. If I had 150 young people, I could sit with every young person. I could take them by the hand and take them to the best possible bank. And that's exactly what they do. We don't have that luxury. Neither do our CBOs. Um, so we really had to use the technology that we built. Our, so the SYP application um, was used with questions that immediately got someone's attention. There's a tab that said getting paid, because that's what this is all about for a young person when they want a job. They want to get paid. Um, and, then, and it started to ask questions. Do you have a bank account? Do you want a bank account? If they said no, it gave them options for, but hey, you will get paid faster. You won't have to pay fees. Um, and so all of these things, this is just as they're applying. This is not after they receive the job. This is just as part of their application. And so um, it started sort of planting these seeds. So if you're applying in March and you have had to fill out all these questions about a bank account, as you're walking down the street thinking, I hope I get picked by the lottery, I hope I get picked by the lottery, then you see, you're starting to see banks that maybe you never saw before. And so when you are selected by the lottery come April, you're looking at that bank differently. You're thinking, I'm going to have a job in a couple of months. Let me go in there and find out about this bank account. But we weren't done with them yet. Um, we also had a small savings incentive program. So these were, it was sort of like raffles to receive anywhere from 25 to 30 to a $500 grand prize for, for opening up a bank account and signing up for direct deposit. And so young people were receiving these emails weekly and then daily um, saying, sign up for direct deposit now with a chance to win. We redesigned our entire participant website, which is a, a website where young people can go to actually sign up for direct deposit, but also find out where their work site is, where their orientation is. Anytime they signed up on that website, there was a big, splashy page that said, Direct deposit, direct deposit. Everywhere they went, it said direct deposit. They were bombarded with this information about direct deposit. And it also didn't hurt that it, they kept getting this idea. It's just sign up and you have a chance to win. There'll be thousands of winners. And there were because the prize was so small. Um, and it worked. I mean, it worked in the first year. And you can see the, the huge increase in the following year. I mean, to say that 30% of the program participants sign up for direct deposit, SYP is our youngest and shortest program. By youngest, I mean the age of participants, and shortest is that it is only six weeks, and yet it has by far the largest number of bank account users and because thanks to this work. Um, we also we noticed that our providers are much more likely to go out and make the find relationships, form relationships with banks, um, find other sources of financial literacy curriculum. They're starting to see that their young people are really excited by this and are interested in this, and so everybody is sort of getting on this financial empowerment back by And Anthony wants me to wrap up, so I'll wrap up. If anybody has any questions, quick question. Today, if someone is 14 
15, and they make money, and they want to open a bank account. Which banks in New York City can a young person and not have all kinds of? Okay. So that's the next step of our work because that was that was the big gap in home. Yeah. There aren't enough good products for young people, especially for Ford. There are some, but there aren't a lot. And so what we our first idea, and we you know we we. Um, we borrow from popular culture. So one thing I left out, which was really helpful in getting young people to sign up for bank accounts, we know that we have kind of a lot of repeaters of the program. If they had signed up for a bank account before, when they went to apply to SYAP, their information would pop up. And it would say, hey Julia, we know that last year you participated in the program and you used this bank account last four numbers here because of this. Um, Think about this bank account. Is it still open? If not, give them a call. Find out if you can reactivate the account. Because in case you're selected, you're going to have the chance to sign up again. And if I was selected in the lottery, I didn't have to re-enter my bank account information. I, because a lot of the error that comes in is just data entry and people entering. Were, were, charge, were there any charges against the direct deposit? Were there any charges? Do you mean people who just didn't like the yeah, idea? Fees, bank fees. Fees? So there are no I mean, it, it, we are not recommending any particular account, so it really is up to the young person to select a good account. So the next, because we didn't feel comfortable in recommending accounts, we did recommend um, the Safe Start accounts that the Office of Financial Empowerment over at DCA recommends. Um, but with the next thing that we're doing for this year, because we looks like we are going to receive the year four grant, um, we're imagining kind of like a Match.com website where somebody will come in and say, I'm 14 years old, I'm in the Bronx, what kind of banks are around, what kind of banks? And then we will actually have a list of banks that are appropriate for them, that have products that are appropriate for them. I, don't, I was the last time, I really don't need to put you in the spot, so you don't have to say specifically, are there any banks that yes. you're aware of in the city yes. that there are no fees that a young person can deposit and save and take out, yes. et cetera? There are fees. So 14 and 15 year olds is harder. 16 and above, we actually have a great uh, product and a great partnership with Santander Bank. Um, and we're hoping to grow it across the city, but they are now have the best product. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, um, years ago in 19, I ain't gonna say the year. <laughs> I was the summer you worked with. Four years, eighth grade, tenth grade, up until like, I was able to get a job. I didn't understand what was going on. I just wanted to make money for my family. But now I think I went into my later years not knowing how to bank. So I opened case, I opened an account, checked an account, savings, money market, whatever the case may be. So I think this is a tremendous um, application that you start that you started already. I can see the development. And the best young kids know at the early age how to open a bank account is fantastic. I just want to give you a good respect. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so we're going to wrap up now uh, with any announcements. Uh, actually, before I do that, the minutes. We need to approve the minutes. So if you had a chance to take the minute, take a look at the minutes. Are there any changes that anyone identified in the minutes? Okay. No, so I just need a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, done with that. Uh, two quick announcements. Uh, first thing, I want to thank the members who brought toys for the DYCD youth, uh, the toy drive this year. So is it, people can still bring in, right? Sir? If people still have, um, I know of what, there's a few members who are still collecting. Um, if you still want to donate and, and you want to do that, let me know so I can make sure that, um, we'll get your gift uh, from you. Or looks figure like, out how to, how to do that. It looks like we're breaking the target. Um, uh, two years ago was what? Three hundred. Uh, two years ago was like 300 toys we collected. Last year was what? Uh, 1,500? This year it was 2000 and we're still collecting, I think, and we had 1558 a couple of days ago. And so on, on the uh, Saturday, December 17th, we're distributing the toys at five beacons across the city. Um, we're trying to get the mayor to the one in Harlem. 
So if anyone's interested in going, uh, it's just a wonderful experience because many of these young people wouldn't get a good gift. And so if anyone's interested in gift wrapping, they're doing it this weekend, wrapping uh, and sorting the toys. Uh, Mattel donated three pallets of toys. Uh, so it's, uh, it'll be very nice. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, and then the last announcement, I know some of you had trouble getting into the building this morning because I was with you trying to get in the building this morning. So we apologize for that and we're going to make sure that uh, for the next meeting that we can all get in and be here on time and be able to start the meeting on time. So we apologize for that and we'll make sure we address that. So uh, the last thing I want to say is uh, we have a little time at the end just to do a little networking, particularly to connect with our new members. And uh, we also want to try to schedule something in the first quarter of next year so that we can get together off time to actually uh, meet each other, connect better. And uh, Anthony and I will be in touch with you between meetings. We're looking at building out the committee structures and doing all types of exciting things, uh, including site visits uh, in the new year so that you can learn more about the program. So uh, that's it with that. Thank you very much. Have a happy holiday, and we'll see you next year.